on KGW News. Finally, answers into the how, when, and where Oregon seniors can get the vaccine. There will still be some hiccups in this process. For the first time, Oregon representatives will vote whether to expel one of their own. A 16-year-old fights for safer schools for students like her. I know so many stories of kids who have been scared to go to school. And later, the Blazers fan literally putting his foot in his mouth. And I, I just tweeted, I said, yeah, if we win this game, I'll eat my shoe. Wait till you see that story. But first tonight, we finally have some clarity on how seniors will be able to sign up for the COVID vaccine. Thank you for joining us tonight on this Friday. I'm Laurel Porter. Those 80 and over are eligible starting Monday, but because of limited supply, not everyone will be able to get an appointment right away. Pat Doris takes us through the steps for scheduling. Monday, when 168,000 people in Oregon who are 80 years old and above become eligible for a COVID shot, only about 3% will get them in that first week at the convention center or the airport vaccination events. Those who try in the Portland area should know the system will not start taking reservations until noon Monday. You can use the automated scheduling tool on the Oregon Health Authority's COVID page. It's at covidvaccine.oregon.gov. Click that white thing in the orange circle on the bottom right side of the page. It will take you through a series of questions. But eventually, if there are times available, you will get a reservation. But you could also call 211 and ask to be transferred to the reservation call center. Operators there will ask questions to make sure you qualify, then book you into a time at either the airport drive through location or the Oregon Convention Center. The first week, there will be about 1,000 doses available at the Convention Center and about 4,450 at the airport drive through site. The airport got more because organizers assumed it would be easier for seniors there. In the meantime, Governor Kate Brown thanked seniors for something many do not have when it comes to waiting for these shots. I want to say thank you to our seniors for your patience thus far and for your continued patience in the coming days and weeks. We are certainly still managing a scarce resource. There is not enough vaccine yet to give everyone who is eligible a shot when they're ready. Many are angry they were pushed behind educators in the shot line, even though most of the deaths from COVID in Oregon are in that senior population. Oregon Health Authority Director Patrick Allen said there is some good news. Oregon ranks 12th in the nation in percentage of population that's received at least one dose of the vaccine at 8.8 percent and 16th in the nation for percent of vaccine used, 67 percent. And he said over the last seven days, there were more than 15,000 people given shots each day. On top of that, he said the amount of vaccine coming to Oregon will soon go up from 52,000 first doses a week to 75,000 a week. And because of that, he expects to move into the rest of 1B in two months. That's a month earlier than expected. By early April, we expect to have allocated enough vaccine to immunize three quarters of Oregon's currently eligible population, including seniors. The online scheduling portal is for people in the Portland metro area, along with Marion and Columbia counties. If you live elsewhere, it's best to call or check online with your county health department for appointments. We also have a vaccine team here working to answer your questions. You can text the number on your screen. It's 503-226-5088. The Meals on Wheels people are looking for ways to help with vaccine appointments. Many seniors have been asking volunteers if they can help them navigate the system. Demand is so high, in fact, the CEO of Meals on Wheels met yesterday with reps from Washington County Public Health, TriMet, and other groups. They talked about setting up a phone number seniors can call for help, or even a program that drives seniors to vaccine sites. That would be really helpful, but none of this is up and running yet. But they're working on it, and we'll let you know what they come up with. Today, Oregon lawmakers made history. They recommended the House vote to expel a fellow member, Representative Diego Hernandez. That comes after several reports accusing Hernandez of sexual harassment at the Capitol. As Catherine Cook reports, the committee tasked with making that decision did not take it lightly. The decision was unanimous. The motion passes. The House will vote on whether or not to expel Representative Diego Hernandez. 
Hernandez is accused of sexually harassing three women and creating a hostile workplace at the state capitol. The House Committee on Conduct made the recommendation Friday after hearing a week of testimony from the women involved. The committee thanked them for their courage. And it's because of all of you that we are sitting here today in the position to take a stand against this type of behavior um, and to hold Representative account- Hernandez accountable and to send a strong message to the Capitol community that this behavior will not be tolerated. Each of the women involved briefly dated Hernandez, but said when they tried to break up with him, he harassed them, creating a hostile workplace. On Friday morning, during a news conference on the vaccine rollout, Governor Brown went off topic to call on Hernandez to resign. If this were any other workplace, Representative Hernandez would have already been shown the door. A slew of lawmakers followed suit, including Senate President Peter Courtney. In a statement, he said, Representative Hernandez's behavior was unacceptable. I have the highest respect for the women who came forward. They have been beyond brave. Representative Hernandez should resign immediately or be expelled. Besides Hernandez's actions, the Committee on Conduct was struck by his apparent lack of accountability. Frankly, by the time it gets to the point where potential expulsion is being discussed, most legislators with serious conduct issues just resign. That has obviously not happened in this case. Hernandez maintains there were problems with the investigation regarding Rule 27, the Capitol's sexual harassment and workplace harassment policy. His attorney released this statement. The committee is making findings of fact and rulings under Rule 27 without considering the evidence that Representative Hernandez has presented. You are the jury appointed to decide the facts under Rule 27. What kind of jury would willingly refuse to hear the evidence? The recommendation to expel Hernandez now goes to the full House for a vote. It needs two-thirds majority to pass, in this case, 40 votes. It's worth noting the House has never before voted to expel a member. Catherine Cook, KGW News. A battleground man is facing federal charges for entering the U.S. Capitol during last month's deadly insurrection. Federal agents say Jeffrey Grace was spotted on security cameras and seen in the background of this widely published photo. The 61-year-old appeared in federal court in Portland on Thursday. If convicted, he could face up to one year in prison. According to court papers, an informant called the FBI tip line after learning Grace had been at the Capitol during the riot. When FBI agents interviewed Grace, investigators say he admitted going into the rotunda. So far, federal cases have been filed against more than 190 people involved in the Capitol siege. Still developing tonight, we are working to learn what led up to a police shooting in Clark County. It was breaking news last night here at 11. Deputies shot someone near the intersection of Northeast 68th and 2nd Avenue in Hazeldale. That person was taken to the hospital in critical condition. We talked with someone who lives in the area, and he says he heard one gunshot, then his fence creaked. Came out out the front door and and I was looking. I could see the back end of the car and somebody's feet laying down on the ground, and and the sheriff told me to get back in the house, so that's what I did. The deputies involved in the shooting are on leave. We still don't know who was shot or how many fired their guns. If I had epilepsy for a reason, maybe it's to help like one person in my school, then that's a good thing. If it's to help two people in my school, that's a good thing. If it's to help millions of people, that's incredible. A brave 16 year old shares her struggle with epilepsy in the hopes of making school safer for other students like her. She's pushing Washington lawmakers to pass a bill that would require schools put a plan in place to better serve students with epilepsy. Our photojournalist Corey Long shares her story in her own words. My name is Callie Wyckoff. I'm in 11th grade. When I was five, I was diagnosed with nocturnal epilepsy, which means I only have seizures at night. And I'm very lucky because there's so many other types of epilepsy that are way more severe. When Callie was five, she had her first grand mal seizure. I wake up and I don't remember anything. My wife and I had no understanding of what epilepsy was prior, really. In my head, just I have a pounding headache. Like, it feels like a semi truck run my head over. It was an extremely scary time for us and for Callie. I felt so abnormal and out of place and like I couldn't 
do anything that my friends were doing. Like I couldn't go have sleepovers. I couldn't just do this stuff because I didn't want to have to tell people, hey, I have epilepsy. People that have epilepsy, they don't really want to talk about it and they don't want to share uh, that because it is something that's personal. Just looking back from like where I was freshman year to now, like I've grown so much. Like if someone came up to me and was like, hey, like what's this epilepsy thing? I'd be like, oh yeah, it's like this. We are so proud of Callie and her growth in just epilepsy and being able to talk about her condition and what she's gone through. I have epilepsy. This is my story. This is who I am and this is what I stand for. She's lived it. She's the voice of kids her age, you know, that are impacted by it. And so, you know, you may have seen her testimony. Everyone has signed in in favor of the bill. Ms. Wyckoff. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and the hearing committee. Thank you for having me back to testify on behalf of the Safe Seizure Schools Bill. It would require all school personnel, so teachers, administrative staff, bus drivers, be trained on seizure first aid and seizure recognition. So the teachers would learn kind of what a seizure looks like, how to respond to it. This whole cause is so important to me because it's so dear to me because I've experienced it firsthand and I know what it's like to be a student living with epilepsy and how that can affect you. Callie is a fantastic advocate. She sat down with me at a local restaurant. Basically, I told my story and they asked me a bunch of questions. She's working hard with other advocates to make sure that legislators around the state are prepared to prioritize this bill. It's very important. And if you've met Callie or spent any time with her, you'll understand how sincere she is and how convinced of the objective she has in front of her. A lot of other states have already passed this bill and I want to be one of those people that can say, I helped pass this bill. And that would just be super awesome and amazing. Well, she's awesome and amazing, isn't she? The Epilepsy Foundation is also proposing a similar bill in Oregon. The hope is to have it ready for the legislature in late fall of this year.